Chapter Twelve of the Wide Wide World. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget. The Wide Wide World by Susan Warner. Chapter Twelve. Splitters. They left the wood and the brook behind them, and crossed a large stubble field, then got over a fence into another. They were in the midst of this when Nancy stopped Ellen and bade her look up towards the west, where towered a high mountain, no longer hid from their view by the trees. I told you I'd show you where I live," said she. "Look up now, clear to the top of the mountain, almost, and a little to the right. Do you see that little mite of a house there? Look sharp. It's almost as brown as the rock. Do you see it? It's close by that big pine tree, but it don't look big from here. It's just by that little dark spot near the top. I see it," said Ellen. "I see it now. Do you live away up there? That's just what I do, and that's just what I wish I didn't." But Granny likes it. She will live there. I don't know what for. If it ain't to plague me, do you think you'd like to live up on top of a mountain like that? No, I don't think I should," said Ellen. "Isn't it very cold up there? Cold? You don't know anything about it. The wind comes there. I tell you, enough to cut you in two. I have to take and hold onto the trees sometimes to keep from being blowed away, and then Granny sends me out every morning before it's light, no matter how deep the snow is, to look for the cow. And it's so bitter cold. I expect nothing else, but I'll be froze to death some time. Oh," said Ellen with a look of horror. "How can she do so?" "Oh, she don't care," said the other. "She sees my nose freeze off every winter, and it don't make no difference." "Freeze your nose off," said Ellen. "To be sure," said the other, nodding gravely. "Every winter, it grows out again when the warm weather comes." And is that the reason why it is so little? Said Ellen innocently and with great curiosity. Little," said the other, crimsoning in a fury. "What do you mean by that? It's as big as yours any day, I can tell you." Ellen involuntarily put her hand to her face to see if Nancy spoke true. Somewhat reassured to find a very decided ridge where her companion's nose was wanting in the line of beauty, she answered in her turn, "It's no such thing, Nancy. You aren't to say so. You know better." I don't know better. I ought to say so," replied the other furiously. "If I had your nose, I'd be glad to have it freeze off. I'd a sight rather have none. I'd pull it every day if I was you to make it grow." "I shall believe what Aunt Fortune said of you was true," said Ellen. She had colored very high, but she added no more and walked on in dignified silence. Nancy stalked before her in silence that was meant to be dignified too, though it had not exactly that air. By degrees, each cooled down, and Nancy was trying to find out what Miss Fortune had said of her, when on the edge of the next field they met the brook again. After running a long way to the right, it had swept around, and here was flowing gently in the opposite direction. But how were they ever to cross it? The brook ran in a smooth current between them and a rising bank on the other side, so high as to prevent their seeing what lay beyond. There were no stepping stones now. The only thing that looked like a bridge was an old log that had fallen across the brook, or perhaps had at some time or other been put there on purpose, and that lay more than half in the water. What remained of its surface was green with moss and slippery with slime. Ellen was sadly afraid to trust herself on it, but what to do? Nancy soon settled the question, as far as she was concerned. Pulling off her thick shoes, she ran fearlessly upon the rude bridge. Her clinging bare feet carried her safely over. And Ellen soon saw her reshoeing herself in triumph on the opposite side, but thus left behind and alone, her own difficulty increased. "Pull off your shoes and do as I did," said Nancy. "I can't," said Ellen. "I'm afraid of wetting my feet. I know Mamma wouldn't let me." "Afraid of wetting your feet," said the other. "What a chicken any you are! Well, if you try to come over with your shoes on, you'll fall in, I tell you, and then you'll wet more than your feet. But come along somehow, for I won't stand waiting here much longer." Thus urged, Ellen set out upon her perilous journey over the bridge, slowly and fearfully, and with as much care as possible. She set step by step upon the slippery log. Already half of the danger was past. When reaching forward to grasp Nancy's outstretched hand, she missed it. Perhaps that was Nancy's fault. Poor Ellen lost her balance and went in head foremost. The water was deep enough to cover her completely as she lay, though not enough to prevent her getting up again. She was greatly frightened, but managed to struggle up first to a sitting posture and then to her feet, and then to wade out to the shore. 
though dizzy and sick she came near falling back again more than once the water was very cold and thoroughly sobered poor ellen felt chill enough in body and mind too all her fine spirits were gone and not the less because nancy's had risen to a great pitch of delight at her misfortune the air rang with her laughter she likened ellen to every ridiculous thing she could think of too miserable to be angry ellen could not laugh and would not cry but she exclaimed in distress oh what shall i do i am so cold come along said nancy give me your hand we'll run over to mrs van brunt's tain't far it's just over here there said she as they got to the top of the bank and came within sight of a top of a house standing only a few fields off there it is run ellen and we'll be there directly who is mrs van brunt ellen contrived to say as nancy hurried her along who is she run ellen why she's just mrs van brunt you're mr van brunt's mother you know make haste ellen we had rain enough the other day i'm afraid it wouldn't be good for the grass if you stayed too long in one place hurry i'm afraid you'll catch cold you got your feet wet after all i'm sure run they did and a few minutes brought them to mrs van brunt's door the little brick walk leading to it from the courtyard gate was as neat as a pin so was everything else the eye could rest on and when nancy went in poor ellen stayed her foot at the door unwilling to carry her wet shoes and dripping garments any further she could hear however what was going on hello mrs van brunt shouted nancy where are you oh mrs van brunt are you out of water cause if you are i've brought you a plenty the person that has it don't want it she's just at the door she wouldn't bring it in till she knew you wanted it oh mrs van brunt don't look so or you'll kill me with laughing come and see come and see the steps within drew near the door and first nancy showed herself and then a little old woman not very old either a very kind pleasant countenance what is all this said she in great surprise bless me poor little dear what is this nothing in the world but a drowned rat mrs van brunt don't you see said nancy go home nancy voss go home said the old lady you're a regular bad girl i do believe this is some mischief of yourn go right off home it's time you were after your cow a great while ago as she spoke she drew ellen in and shut the door poor little dear said the old lady kindly what has happened to you come to the fire love you're trembling with the cold oh dear dear you're soaking wet this is all along of nancy somehow i know how was it love ain't you miss fortunes little girl never mind don't talk darling there ain't one bit of color in your face not one bit good mrs van brunt had drawn ellen to the fire and all this while she was pulling off as fast as possible her wet clothes then sending a girl who was in waiting for clean towels she rubbed ellen dry from head to foot and wrapping her in a blanket left her in a chair before the fire while she went to seek something for her to put on ellen had managed to tell who she was and how her mischance had come about but little else though the kind old lady had kept on pouring out words of sorrow and pity during the whole time she came trotting back directly with one of her own short gowns the only thing that she could lay hands on that was anywhere near ellen's length enormously big it was for her but mrs van brunt wrapped it round and round and the blanket over it again and then she bustled about till she had prepared a tumbler of hot drink which she said was to keep ellen from catching cold it was anything but agreeable being made from some bitter herb and sweetened with molasses but ellen swallowed it as she would anything else at such kind hands and the old lady carried herself into a little room opening out of the kitchen and laid her in a bed that had been warmed for her excessively tired and weak as she was ellen scarcely needed the help of the hot herb tea to fall into a very deep sleep perhaps it might not have lasted so very long as it did but for that afternoon changed for evening evening grew quite dark still ellen did not stir and after every little journey into the bedroom to see how she was doing mrs van brunt came back saying how glad she was to see her sleeping so finely other eyes looked on her for a minute kind and gentle eyes though mrs van brunt's were kind and gentle too once a soft kiss touched her forehead there was no danger of waking her it was perfectly dark in the little room and had been so a good while when ellen was aroused by some noise and then a rough voice she knew very well feeling faint and weak and not more than half awake yet she lay still and listened she heard the outer door open and shut and then the voice said so mother you've got my stray sheep here have you 
ay ay said the voice of mrs van brunt have you been looking for her how did you know she was here looking for her ay looking for her ever since sundown she has been missing at the house since some time this forenoon i believe her aunt got a bit scared about her anyhow i did she's a queer little chip as ever i see she's a dear little soul i know said his mother you needn't say nothin agin her i ain't a-goin to believe it no more am i i'm the best friend she's got if she only knowed it but don't you think said mr van brunt laughing i asked her to give me a kiss this afternoon and if i'd been an owl she couldn't have been more scared she went off like a streak and miss fortune said she was as mad as she could be and that's the last of her how did you find her out i met that mischievous foss girl and i made her tell me she had no mind to at first it'll be the worse for ellen if she takes to that wicked thing she won't nancy has been taking her a walk and worked it so as to get her into the brook and then brought her here just as dripping wet as she could be i gave her something hot and put her to bed and she'll do i reckon but i tell you it gave me queer feelings to see the poor little thing just as white as ashes and all of a tremble and looking so sorrowful too she's sleeping finely now but it ain't right to see a child's face look so it ain't right repeated mrs van brunt thoughtfully you han't had supper have you no mother and i must take that young one back ain't she awake yet i'll see directly but she ain't going home nor you neither brahm till you've got your supper it would be a sin to let her she shall have a taste of my splitters this very night i've been making them a purpose for her so you may just take off your hat and sit down you mean to let her know where to come when she wants good things mother well i won't say splitters ain't worth waiting for ellen heard him sit down and then she guessed from the words that passed that mrs van brunt and her little maid were busied in making the cakes she lay quiet you're a good friend brahm began the old lady again nobody knows that better than me but i hope that poor little thing has got another one to-day that'll do more for her than you can what yourself mother i don't know about that no no do you think i mean myself there turn it quick sally miss alice has been here how this evening just a little before dark on her gray pony she came in for a minute and i took her that'll burn sally i took her in to see the child while she was asleep and i told her all you told me about her she didn't say much but she looked at her very sweet as she always does and i guess there now i'll see after my little sleeper and presently mrs van brunt came to the bedside with a light and her arm full of ellen's dry clothes ellen felt as if she could have put her arms round her kind old friend and hugged her with all her heart but it was not her way to show her feelings before strangers she suffered mrs van brunt to dress her in silence only saying with a sigh how kind you are to me ma'am to which the old lady replied with a kiss and telling her she mustn't say a word about that the kitchen was bright with firelight and candlelight the tea-table looked beautiful with its piles of white splitters besides plenty of other and more substantial things and at the corner of the hearth sat mr van brunt so said he smiling as ellen came in and took her stand at the opposite corner so i drove you away this morning you ain't mad with me yet i hope ellen crossed directly over to him and putting her little hand in his great one said i'm very much obliged to you mr van brunt for taking so much trouble to come and look after me she said it with a look of gratitude and trust that pleased him very much trouble indeed said he good-humouredly i'd take twice as much any day for what you wouldn't give me this forenoon but never fear miss ellen i ain't a-going to ask you that again he shook the little hand and from that time ellen and her rough charioteer were firm friends mrs van brunt now summoned them to table and ellen was well feasted with the splitters which were a kind of rich shortcake baked in irons very thin and crisp and then split in two and buttered whence their name a pleasant meal was that whatever an epicure might have thought of the tea to ellen in her famished state it was delicious and no epicure could have found fault with the cold ham and the butter and the cakes but far better than all was the spirit of kindness that was there ellen feasted on that more than on anything else if her host and hostess were not very polished they could not have been outdone in their kind care of her and kind attention to her wants and when the supper was at length over mrs van brunt declared a little color had come back to the pale cheeks 
The color came back in good earnest a few minutes after, when a great tortoise-shell cat walked into the room. Ellen jumped down from her chair, and presently was bestowing the tenderest caresses upon Pussy, who stretched out her head and purred as if she liked them very well. "'What a nice cat,' said Ellen. "'She has five kittens,' said Mrs. Van Brunt. Five kittens,' said Ellen. "'Oh, may I come some time and see them?' "'You shall see em right away, dear, and come as often as you like, too. Sally, just take a basket and go fetch them kittens here.' Upon this Mr. Van Brunt began to talk about it being time to go, if they were going. But his mother insisted that Ellen should stay where she was. She said she was not fit to go home that night, that she oughtn't to walk a step, and that Brom should go and tell Miss Fortune the child was safe and well, and would be with her early in the morning. Mr. Van Brunt shook his head two or three times, but finally agreed, to Ellen's great joy. When he came back she was sitting on the floor before the fire, with all the five kittens in her lap, and the old mother-cat walking around and over her and them. But she looked up with a happier face than he had ever seen her wear, and told him she was so much obliged to him for taking such a long walk for her. And Mr. Van Brunt felt that, like his oxen, he could have done a great deal more with pleasure. End of chapter 12